Good morning. Thank you for, uh, for coming. I'd like to conclude the two-day discussion with an initiative that I'll be presenting on behalf of our team. This is something that uh, we've worked on in the past few months, and uh, it's somewhat simplistic uh, hearing the, you know, just a few of the complications that, you know, uh, EMS uh, faces on the field. But uh, basically, um, let's see here, this is... Um, there are several things that will dictate, uh, or several facts that will dictate the outcomes in cardiogenic shock. Um, this has been talked about throughout the, uh, throughout the two days here. Number one is the myocardial insult. It's not as simple. There are several factors that will lead to cardiogenic shock, whether we're dealing with an ACS shock, valvular disease, postcardiotomy, acute rejection, so on and so forth. Number two is that uh, there are a lot of different uh, 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 mechanisms that will uh, that the body is equipped with to compensate for the uh, uh, degree of shock. And this is also not simple. So this is just an example of what happens in an acute myocardial infarction setting. There's an acute LV systolic and diastolic dysfunction that will lead to a progressive decline in uh, progressive ischemia, multiple different factors that will lead to progressive decline in the cardiac function. And in addition to that, the surge response that happens and uh, the, its implications with respect to the blood pressure and uh, 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 inflammatory factors. And the response of the body, whether you're dealing with an acute setting versus a chronic setting, is also different. This is just one example of the hemodynamic profile that is also completely different in, in the acute uh, AMI shock, for example, versus the acute decompensated heart failure shock, where they have higher filling pressures and uh, higher PA pressures. In addition to that, we're dealing with uh, end organ function that also varies from individuals, young patient versus old patient, and the implications of cardiogenic shock on end organ function. We're not talking about the heart, we're talking about cardiopulmonary, a cardiohepatic, a cardiorenal uh, uh, processes that were, that were discussed in depth on Friday. And, but what we've seen from published data is that, you know, once you have evidence of multi-organ dysfunction in shock, it's very difficult to improve prognosis. This is just an example of uh, 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 multiple different studies showing that you can improve hemodynamics by improving cardiac output, but uh, there is a significant difference between survivors and non-survivors, whether you're talking about the source response that happens or we're dealing with evidence of end organ dysfunction. If you develop liver dysfunction, kidney dysfunction, uh, uh, renal dysfunction, or elevated bilirubin, those are all associated with, higher, uh, with worse outcomes. And then we talk about uh, physicians and healthcare providers with the different, divide, different medications that they provide, and Dr. DeBaker discussed about uh, that yesterday. And then PERC MCS therapy and different centers have different expertise on what they, uh, when, what they, what they provide and how they, uh, they approach it. And then the thing that we would focus on with respect to um, cardiogenic shock management is the timing. You know, when the timing to identify cardiogenic shock and then the time to support in cardiogenic shock. So all these factors play a role in outcomes in cardiogenic shock. One thing that uh, we've been looking at is, uh, you know, this is the theme, whether it's in, in, in published data or in our own experience, is that time is uh, muscle. And just looking at some prelim analysis, this is very preliminary analysis that was done just a few days ago um, um, at a level one shock uh, center, looking at all the transfer center calls in the past two years that were initiated because patients um, are not doing well, they need to be transferred to higher level care. Um, there were a total of 761 patients who were identified based on their discharge diagnosis from that tertiary hospital as cardiogenic shock. However, the caller on the smaller community hospital identified shock in only 10% of them, labeled this as shock. I'm sending you a patient who's sick, but only 10% were in cardiogenic shock identified at the other hospital, okay? And then because of a lot of limitations, 18% of patients who uh, were, or physicians who called the transfer center, actually the patients were turned down because of capacity. Again, this is very prelim data. This is not uh, adjusted for multiple different factors, but just to just give an idea of uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, problems that uh, we face as healthcare providers. And then if you look at the, we have the time data is available only 516 patients of the 716. And what we found that the time from you calling the transfer center and getting an acceptance to get the patient to a higher level uh, care is about 13 hours. This is the average time. And I think if people look at it at, across different systems, they probably will have, uh, will have the same results. And the reason is obviously it's multifactorial between capacity, uh, between getting the patients uh, in and, and, and transferred out, assuming that they are even stable for transfer. Okay, so um, this model of the uh, hub and spoke that was discussed at the uh, um, 
uh, scientific session, that scientific uh, statement that was published in 2017, does not really address uh, the issue of delays in transfer. And we've seen across all studies that time factor is important. If there is delay in care, multi-organ function dysfunction happens and patients die. So the whole genesis of this, uh, the cardiogenic shock initi initiative is about time, is to be able to early, ident early identification, to support patients early, and actually to provide adequate support. And Dr. Carr discussed this, and uh, there was an agreement across this on Saturday that you should actually support fully and then de-escalate as a better approach than uh, support gradually and go up. <clears throat> For early identification, the whole purpose is similar to semi-patients is to be able to do something called door to support, and Dr. Albaniosi just uh, mentioned that in his, in his talk earlier this morning. For us to be able to do that, we have uh, to have a proper platform, an easy triage algorithm. You, see, you heard some of the challenges that EMS uh, uh, faces in the field to see if it's feasible, if it's valid, and if we can actually have large scale, scale reproducibility of such algorithm. So talk about a proper platform of being able to do so. Um, one, uh, one, one algorithm, Dr. Carr mentioned that, similar to what trauma people do, is to have a level one, sh uh, level one shock center. This shock center is a dedicated shock center, whether it's a transplant VAD program, but this center is capable of providing full per biventricular support and cardiopulmonary support. A level two shock center will have a 24-7 PCI cable center, and you've heard that in Houston there are 27 PCI cable centers. Uh, they can provide partial support with some of the per support devices that we have out there. And then a level three non-shock center, that are the, those are the non-PCI cable centers. So assuming that we have this platform to implement the next step, then um, the next step is to see what we can do on the field. Um, from an EMS perspective, obviously it's somewhat straightforward if someone is hypotensive, but they have evidence of ACS, SC elevations, they have their own algorithm to get the patient to a PCI cable center, that would be either a level one or level two shock center. But if you're dealing with a, a hypotensive patient uh, without evidence of ACS that, that is apparent on the EKG, then the next step is to try and see if we can quantify patients uh, amongst four different categories. And that, the theme of four will be, uh, uh, will be shown multiple different times uh, across the next few slides, is to be able to uh, see if we can triage patients uh, based on their physical exam, and the focus would be on those who are cold and wet, and those patients who, are, who appear volume overloaded, but they're hypotensive and actually evidence of hypoperfusion. Uh, then we'd look at um, their age, younger than 80, those patients who are afebrile to exclude septic patients. They don't have an active DNR-DNI order, and those patients without, uh, with, without a known terminal illness, liver cirrhosis, uh, or end-stage renal disease. And again, if they have evidence of hypoperfusion, whether we're talking about cool extremities, altered mental status, and narrow pulse pressure, edema and crackles, then at that point, uh, obviously EMS, as, as you heard, will either initiate epinephrine or norepinephrine. And on the field, if the dose requirement is more than 0.2 for either, or dopamine, which right now is, uh, is not in use in Houston, or the need for two vasoactive agents, then the process would be to get the patients to a level one center. Uh, obviously, with, it, with, with Houston's traffic, it's sometimes difficult to get patients to a level one center. Then those patients should be transferred to a level, level two center, but uh, have a discussion with a level one, uh, with a level one team. Now, we're not gonna stop there. Once the patients get to the emergency room at a level two center, then uh, obviously they will be monitored for the next four hours based on this algorithm. And again, the rule of four. If the urine output is less than 40 over the next four hours or per hour, if their lactate is more than four, if their ASD and LT is more than four times the normal, if their creatinine is more than 0.4 of their baseline, or they have progressive pulmonary edema requiring non-invasive ventilation or intubation, then at that point we'll have a discussion with the local cardiology team and discuss again with the level one trauma, uh, level one shock team and transfer those patients to a level one shock center as opposed to admitting the patients to that hospital, see if they can manage them with partial support and then deal with the issues of transfers and delays of care at that point. Now the question is, is it feasible and it, it, or not? You know, there are multiple different uh, 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 limitations that I can actually uh, uh, look at. Number one is, uh, what will be the pos positive predictive value of this approach? Can we validate this, you know, look at those uh, four different parameters that we set up in the emergency room or on the field? Is it easy to impl implement or not? Number two, uh, will it have issues with uh, you know, EMS? Are they gonna be able to adopt this, this algorithm easily or not uh, in those who are hypotensive? 
And then will there be any utility of uh, point of care testings of troponins, BNP, lactate, or you heard about this uh, CRI, for example, in the field. Uh, next is what will happen in the emergency room at the level two shock centers, um, and are they being transferred out? Is that going? Is it, will that rule of four of urine output and lactate will be? Will they be able to predict that those patients will develop progressive shock, and it's actually better to get them to a shock center? And then the last is what will the impact on bed capacity at level one center? You've heard that we're always at capacity. 18% of uh, the patients in that uh, uh, data set that we looked at were turned down because of capacity issues. And what is the ideal shock team infrastructure? You know, when Dr. Albaniosi mentioned that earlier in his uh, shock, uh, shock center components, uh, having a shock coordinator, a nurse, a physician on 24 seven. And then obviously what will the economical uh, implications across the healthcare system? Uh, of this this algorithm and with that I'll end and thank you thank you well, that's a uh, that's a great initial presentation try to make a very complicated thing and translate into something simple actionable so I would like to hear the first response from the first responder Dr. Pierce. so uh, this is great and I uh, I endorse what you're what you're proposing um, we need to keep it simple for the guys in the field. So uh, the more we can, and I'm, I think we need to start leaning towards things like checklists. Mm -hmm. uh, the checklist mentality, it's, it's been terrifically su uh, successful in the uh, uh, airline industry, right, and, and flying planes and stuff. Because we don't want to miss patients. The other thing is that no matter what we do and how well we get at it, there are going to be patients who are going to get over triage, and so the system's going to have to you know, be tolerant of that. But I, I think what you're proposing is, is doable. Um, we've got some other speakers going, because again, as we look at the bigger picture, mm -hmm then we need, it needs to fit into that, and I don't see why it can't. Awesome. I'll take the next, I'll come to you, uh, Imran. Dr. Wang, you're the regional uh, planner, so what are your thoughts? I'm Henry Wang, I'm an emergency physician, probably the only one in this room. I'd like to offer a few perspectives just to keep this vision in check. So remember that shock masquerades as many different conditions, and so the clinical uh, pr proposal here for a pre-hospital assessment could very much look like a patient with cardiogenic shock, or septic shock, or the hemorrhagic shock that you didn't know about because no one mentioned the black tarry stools in the toilet. So this is a much more complex condition than uh, one could imagine. And while I applaud our medics here, who are phenomenal here in Houston, I've seen many EMS systems, believe it or not, simple assessments can be extremely difficult in the field. Warm and wet, cold and wet, very, even getting a body temperature in the pre-hospital setting is not standard of care because of all of the technical difficulties. We need a device that's accurate. We need a, 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 a body part to measure that's accurate. Even something as simple as that, which is salient in this assessment, can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I applaud this concept and this effort, this vision. I encourage us to continue to evolve and reach for new techniques and technologies to further this idea. Awesome. Now going to the hospital system, which we'll deal. So, so I, I think this is a great initiative, and Marwan, I, as as you, Dr. Carr, have done great work in shock. I think what we need to put it out there and pledge is that our city is probably the most equipped to break institutional barriers to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. Invest in the field. If Detroit can do a Detroit shock initiative. I think there are times where I'm giving your number to the refereeing doc because it's been two days that I can't get somebody into my institution. So we have to pledge to, to invest in simplifying the field assessment and simplifying the clinical part, but trying to complicate the overall network so that we have a long-term sustainable investment. And I think I would like us to pledge on that so we continue this effort, work with the field, break, break the institutional barriers, and create some kind of an algorithm that the ACC statement is proposing, probably even in a more efficient way with all the institutions across the, <coughs> the I city. I think one, one thing is we need to test whatever we decide, you know, pilot it uh, across a couple of hospitals first and, and see what the, you know, can we validate some of the stuff that we're looking at and then see if we can we can expand that. Yeah. So. It's a Question from there. One question over here to the right. Maybe go from left to right. Okay, let's go to that. Left to right. Go back. Thank you for, the, for this uh, interesting initiative. So I'm also had an EMTB uh, experience. Did my emergency medicine residency. I'm doing critical care right now. So I can understand how this can be really complex on the EMS level. 
one of the things that I'm, I want to see what the panel thinks is empowering emergency physician when they identify cardiogenic shock and this patient who might be benefit from initiating ECMO to empower them to talk to the shock teams in, in, in Houston and, and transfer the patient without necessarily going through the critical care physician or the cardiologist or the cardiac surgeon because I think they are very well capable on identifying cardiogenic shock and especially if they think that this patient will benefit from mechanical circulatory support. Any emergency medicine uh, resident now are trained in doing simple bedside um, echocardiogram and, and I think if we empower them, we can cut the middleman and decrease the transfer time. Just a thought. See, the, the, um, well, there's one point in, in, across all my slides, I made uh, 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 an effort not to have an echocardiogram there. Um, or an assessment of the LV function because this can actually give you false reassurances or can misdiagnose patients. You can't diagnose cardiogenic shock based on an echocardiogram, and that's one of the one of the limitations that there is no specific test that can give you yes or no immediately. Dr. Burke. So one thing that unfortunately you're going to have to tackle, whether it's Houston or anywhere else, is the power of ego, right? Is is the inherent problem that everybody. Do you want to be in the level two or the level three center? And so to know thyself and to know the capabilities is very challenging. And oftentimes that's the underscored problem why patients sit at other hospitals. You know, I use the example of like a faucet. If it drips a little, you rarely call a plumber. You call the plumber when there's a flood. And unfortunately, probably like our center, you only get the calls about the floods. Um, maybe working with your colleagues in the other institutions um, to really try and get past that ego. If they know you, they know your cell phone, perhaps they'd be more willing when, when your EMS person or your ER physician says, you know, let's call up a memorial or call somewhere else. Otherwise, it's met with, no, 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 what are you talking about? We'll take care of it until it's Friday night and there's trouble. Can I ask, actually? I agree with you more. I think Mr. Pyle Dr. Kimraj was saying the same thing. The <coughs> institutional barrier is Spanish for egos, and that's what you're trying to break down. But I think if you can convey, based on a, after a validated model, that you as a physician, your first dose is to do the best for the patient. And when you make the call, you're proving that your concern for your patient is bigger than your ego, I think would have come a long way. I know it's easier said than done, but we'll have to do that. Dr. Anderson, you had a point. Uh, just um, the, um, this goes back to the minimum, what, 13 hours you mentioned for transfers, and also the concept of keeping patients in ERs, these sick patients, um, and then a possible hospital transfer. Um, and Dr. Purse might address this too. Th my understanding is that inter-hospital transfers, especially of really sick patients requiring a lot of support, but inter-hospital transfers using EMS-type services are low priority that the, the goal, you know, most of the EMS vehicles need to be out on the streets, and so to go arrange an inter-hospital transfer actually becomes a lower priority item, is that correct? Um, yes and no, so the 911 system generally doesn't do inter-facility transfers, even emergency ones, so that's left, in, at least in, in Houston, that's left to the private industry ambulances. The problem there is that if you run that, so, you, uh, so Dr. Anderson, you've got your uh, Anderson's Ambulance Company, congratulations. Uh, you're there to maximize profit, so you're going to staff uh, your your services to your predicted call volume, your predicted workload. And when you get an emergency transfer, that wasn't on the schedule, so you're going to get to it just as quick as you can. That'll be about two hours, and so uh, you know, and that's with a simple routine one. Now, if you make it a critical care one, where I have to get my critical care team and I have to get my special critical care ambulance, the time just goes up and up and up and up. So, so that's that's one thing. So I was thinking of your slide that had the four-hour hold in the ED with a possible transfer and thinking that, you know, given these kind of logistics, that it might become to, difficult too. It's not going to start from a day zero is the optimal solution. It's going to evolve. Mm -hmm. And is it this transport issue, how we solve that, with the time, we, uh, we talked with the guys with IMSA and we sat with them. They are having for us now priority because they knew what kind of patient we have. If we ask them, the car is within certain number of minutes is in front, it's in front of the ER and our team is, is ready. That means it's not going to from day zero, it takes time and to, to, and to sit with the leadership and to discuss what kind of patient you are going to transport, why you need that in an urgent way, and such kind of transport like that. 
it's you, you need. Otherwise, you're not going to put them those patients like any other patient in, in, in a waiting in, in a waiting list. Okay, I'd like to speak for just a minute. I'm Daryl Pyle, and I'm the CEO of the Southeast Texas Regional Advisory Council. We were formed about 25 years ago to solve these kind of problems. It started out with trauma with Dr. Red Duke and Dr. Ken Maddox and others. We created trauma levels. We made sure we busted through some ego problems. We made sure that, that we uh, sped up the ability to transfer between facilities. I think there's room to improve. Uh, now, with this uh, proposal, I think we should probably start out with a group of subject matter experts in the next month or two and decide on what's the profile, what are the attributes we need in a hospital, what are the attributes we need in the EMS agencies that tend to use those hospitals. Don't forget, we have 55 EMS agencies. So we don't want to go out and get everybody involved in this until we can create a model between a few hospitals and a few EMS agencies. Uh, I could go on and on, but that, that <laughs> that's a summary. We've got to get down to the personality of the EMS agencies and the personalities of the hospitals and work all the kinks out and then have a model to roll out. And I hope next year when you meet, we can tell you about our progress. Dr. That's Carr, a I have great a idea. Questions. I think that's generating a lot of. I think uh, I heard from the ED perspective, we need to have working groups, EMS to the local ED. That's the first point of contact because what is available, what is feasible, what is not feasible, they have dealt with it on a regular basis. So you have different zones where different EMS goes to that point of care hospital. So that ED would be the first person on contact. The second problem is intra-hospital transfer is the second phase. You need to get the patient from the field or from home to the first place. And that direction, whether that ED physician who's contacting the EMS can tell which would be the best place to go. So educating the ED group in regards to one, two, three, and then the ED person in contact with EMS to tell what they have in their uh, armamentarium to really uh, assess the patient to get to that first level. In regards to transfer in between hospitals, I think that's education and telling that this patient is beyond the capabilities of what is offered in that hospital. And then going into the level one centers which could offer full support. We probably have to do something like that. Our, every point that was raised was just to streamline that process. But to Dr. Wang's point that uh, shock itself is difficult to identify. And then to identify cardiogenic shock and pinpoint in the EMS is almost impossible. So maybe we need to broaden this as a shock and go to the nearest ER, and the ER who is a trained MD can make that triage and then take it from there. Of course, the logistics of inter-hospital transfers and all those will have to be worked out. You know, I think this is a, a great idea, and I, and I love it. Um, I think you know there are some realities that you know are very very challenging to work through, as I'm sure you well know. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges at, that I see is um, when you are in another ER. One of the quality metrics of ER care is the duration of time that a patient's in the ER. And uh, that can be a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. uh, it obviously makes them highly motivated to accurately triage, initiate treatment very quickly, and that's one of their particular areas of expertise. But it also is, uh, many ERs are not equipped or interested in providing a prolonged period of care and four hours in ER you know, terminology could be considered prolonged. And so I think it'll be important to make sure you you know, have buy-in from these ERs. And in some cases, it may be valuable to provide um, specific recommendations about what diagnostic tests could be beneficial. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned echocardiogram, and that's always a challenge to get a formal one, and a lot of ER providers do it at bedside, and there's, that is its own double-edged sword. Um, but I would encourage you to make sure to collaborate very tightly with the ER for that specific algorithm to make sure that you're offering that, or asking them to do something they're willing to do. Awesome. Thank you, Marwan. That Thank was you. great, and we'll.